Good evening. Welcome to our Bermuda District public meeting on the FY22 proposed budget. My name is Jim Engel, and I have the distinct honor of representing the Bermuda District on the Board of Supervisors. Ann Coker, the Vice Chair of the School Board, also representing the Bermuda District, is here with us as well. Ann and I have worked together closely on the FY22 budgets to balance the needs of our schools as I have worked to balance the needs of our citizens in a responsible manner. I appreciate her willingness to participate and help with any school-related questions later, and I'd like to now give Ann a chance to share some comments. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having me here this evening. I'm Ann Coker, Vice Chair of the School Board and Representative for the Bermuda District. I'm very excited about the progress that the Board of Supervisors and the School Board has, have made this year, um, particularly in relation to teacher decompression and other funding initiatives. The Board of Supervisors has shown the school division and the public their commitment to public education in Chesterfield County. Chesterfield is a great place to live, work, and learn, and I look forward to tonight's presentation, and again, thank you for having me. Thank you, Ann. This budget, as you will see, has a strong focus on public safety and education, especially our sworn personnel and our educators on the front lines in our schools. We have also maintained funding to support all of the other county services our citizens have come to enjoy. This is remarkable considering the challenges of our past year. Tonight, we will hear from Matt Harris and David Oakley as they present the proposed budget, and after their presentation, we look forward to answering your questions. Matt? Well, thank you, Mr. Engel. We'll, uh, we'll jump right into uh, the presentation if we can. Uh, we got about 20 slides uh, that we're gonna run through tonight as just a high-level summary of a work session that uh, the Board of Supervisors held in this room uh, several weeks back. Uh, just to give you a, a flavor, uh, some highlights from this budget, but the, uh, the county's website, chestville.gov, the blueprint Chestville website, uh, has all of the materials, the full work session, uh, a full budget document with narratives, line item detail, uh, revenue line item detail, anything that you would wanna know about the fiscal 22 budget as well as any prior budgets. And you can see a lot of trend work on there, uh, economic indicators talking about the local Chestville economy. So there's a wealth of information that's available to, uh, to the public on the web. And I certainly encourage you to, uh, to check that out. If you see something on there that uh, you have questions about or something that you, you can't find, you can always, always 365 days a year, email us at blueprint at chesterfield.gov that goes to a number of people's accounts, and we'll get you a response uh, very quickly. So that's not just a budget time resource, but anytime you have questions about resources or how we go about allocating those here in Chesterfield County, please uh, feel free to check that out. A couple of housekeeping notes about where we are in the process, because I think that's really important. So what we're showing you tonight, these highlights in the uh, ensuing slides, really represent the county administrator's proposed budget that he has put forth before the Board of Supervisors. And we are out now in a two or three week block where we collect feedback on that proposal. So the board is just, uh, they've received that from the county administrator. It, it encompasses the school board's proposal as well. It's been approved by them. All of that is brought together. Uh, soon into uh, to one overall plan, and now we're putting that forth before the public. Uh, this is our fifth of five uh, budget town halls we're doing through Facebook Live. Again, we've pivoted to this format given uh, COVID vaccine uh, or excuse me, the COVID issue. Uh, we certainly uh, hope to be in person with you as we move forward. Uh, but I think we'll always have uh, some element of uh, these Facebook town halls because I think it's given us a broader audience and uh, we've gotten really good feedback from them. But uh, tonight's the fifth of those. We have tomorrow night in this room as well, the overall budget public hearing where uh, folks have the opportunity to come out and speak to all five board members. There's also ways you can give feedback online. We have a form at the uh, Blueprint Chesterfield website where you can go and fill out if you don't want to come out tomorrow night or just can't come out and you want to have, a, have your voice heard, you have a comment for the board, you can still leave that in, a, uh, in an online format. And then the board is scheduled to adopt 
this overall plan with whatever changes that they see fit that they might hear tonight or in any of the prior meetings or just through phone calls, email, any other types of normal feedback. All of that gets incorporated into the plan. They vote on that for April the uh, 7th. We're talking about fiscal 22. Uh, we jump the calendar year by six months, so our fiscal year begins July the 1st. So that's what, uh, just to kind of orient you into our calendar here. So when you see fiscal 22, we're talking about the spending plan that goes into effect on July the 1st. So let's, uh, let's jump into the presentation itself. I'd like to start any budget presentation, no matter what's going on, with some sort of nod to the economic conditions that support whatever spending is being recommended. Uh, it's in, even more important in this uh, age of COVID because we have seen some you know, very strange patterns in the data. And this chart here is looking at unemployment rates uh, for the neighboring localities, Chesterfield County, the overall metropolitan area, and the state as well. And it doesn't matter really which one you pick. The, the, the shape of the line is very, very similar in each instance. We're showing a longer time period here because we're trying to make one uh, very important point. When you look back at 07, 08, that recession, prior, previously known as the Great Recession, you see a sort of steady climb in unemployment. It holds in that 7 to 8% range for uh, several years and then takes you know the better part of a decade, really, to come back down into a normal range in the 3 to 4% mark, whereas, which is where we were a year ago, March, uh, prior to the onset of COVID. Then almost overnight, uh, depending on which one of the lines you want to peek at, that spikes up into the double digits as high as 14% for, uh, for the overall region you see there on the far right-hand side of this chart. That's the environment by which we were building a budget um, last year, and we'll talk a little bit more about that evolution here in a second. But I think the difference, what I really want to point everybody's attention to, is the shape of the recovery in this current downturn versus the prior one. It goes up overnight, but effectively comes down overnight as well. So as we head into this budget, and you'll see some large increases that are being proposed, the message in this slide is this is a very different uh, downturn and recovery from anything we've ever seen, and we have confidence in the underlying fundamentals in Chesterfield County are strong enough to support the spending plan that we are going to go through with you tonight, particularly with respect to residential real estate conditions, and consumer spending trends in the county. So I mentioned this just a second ago, the evolution of, uh, of the budget over the last 12 months. And really, there's been about four budgets in the span of uh, 12 months where there normally would be you know, only two. So let's just walk you across this matrix, and uh, not to really delve into any number in particular, but just to kind of give you a sense of what we've been doing because I think there's been a lot of headlines that focus on the overall increase between 22 and 21. Uh, but, you know, we just want to temper that a little bit by walking through this chart real quickly. So FY20 on the far left-hand side, our general fund budget, and we'll talk more about what that means uh, in particular in just a second, it's $733 million. When we sat in here just a few days before COVID last year, it really straddled that, uh, that onset where everything started to shut down. We proposed a budget like we're doing right now to the Board of Supervisors at 773, a 5% increase. We come back less than a month later with that spike in unemployment and all the other economic news that was hitting us very hard, uh, trimming over $50 million out of that proposed budget actually adopted a budget that was lower than it was the year before, but all of that anticipated economic growth had gone away in just a matter of days. We came back in December. We're constantly looking at the economic data. We got a few more data points. We came back in here to the board. November, December timeframe, we said things are definitely better than we expected. We had taken a very conservative path uh, you know, a year ago, not knowing where it was gonna head. We put some money back in the budget. The first thing that came back in, and this has been done, the year of the workforce between the investments in, uh, in teachers and other classroom personnel, as well as public safety, and the board approved the public safety pay plan uh, back in December of 2020. And that's where you see that's kind of 753 mark. Fast forward to today on the far right-hand block at 806, that's the total we're proposing for the general fund portion. All of that to say, 
you know, the news media kind of zeroes in on 806 versus 721 and say, this is a big jump. It's $85 million. It's 11%. You know, can that be sustained? But I think the, the thing to keep in mind is it's really kind of 806 versus 773 where we thought we would be one year ago. Uh, that gets, you know, lost in the mix. So while it's a single year increase from 21 to 22, it's effectively a two-year increase because all of that growth we anticipated, which most of which materialized, you know, from an adoption perspective, never actually shows up in any chart other than this. So that's why we walk through this. Uh, it is a large increase, but again, it's really capturing the growth from two fiscal years and not just one, and thus the larger increases from a nominal perspective and a percentage inspective perspective. So just a little more detail on the revenues. You see down the bottom corner, $85 million increase from fiscal 21 to fiscal 22 proposed. You see the, t the big uh, sources of that real estate taxes and local sales taxes. The, the home buying activity in Chesterfield County would continue to be a place that people want to come, not just from new home construction, but uh, a lot of competition for existing home sales throughout the county. The average home price in Chesterfield increased 4.25% during calendar year 2020, even with COVID. Uh, that's where you see, that's what you receive reflected in that top line. And then the $20 million in local sales tax, again, some of that is reflective of the big cut that we anticipated a year ago. But overall, we still had 9% growth in sales tax as folks staying home, staying closer uh, you know, to where they live and work here in Chesterfield County. And those dollars also stayed with them. They weren't you know, straying as far from their home or their workplace, shopping Chesterfield, eating Chesterfield. And that had a profound impact on our bottom line. And we hope to retain some of that, quite honestly, moving forward. I think we've proven out Chesterfield has incredible buying power, 350,000 strong. And I think now we're starting to see and people are understanding there's a lot of options, uh, whether you're just doing your everyday grocery shopping, whether you're going out to eat, whether you're going to uh, you know, do some repairs on the house. Spending those monies here has a real impact on what we're able to do from a budget perspective, and you see that uh, captured here. And again, we hope that trend continues. I'm going to hit on this real quickly. Actually, I'm going to back up for a second because we go down about five or six lines. You see state or federal aid, only a $2 million increase. That's not a huge part of our overall revenue picture on the county side. Uh, and a couple things to note, that's the first one. The second one is there isn't this large influx of stimulus dollars really in the county plan or the school plan. Uh, there are additional monies that are expected to show up during the course of the next 12 to 24 months, but those will be invested in one-time projects as they were during this past year. Uh, the federal stimulus dollars continue to flow and we will receive them and spend them in a responsible way, but we're not gonna invest them in programs or services that have an ongoing cost. We're gonna look for those infrastructure or tax relief type measures that uh, support the community or, or further some goals uh, for the organization on the county or school side. So this budget is not made possible. That $85 million is not the product of federal stimulus dollars. Uh, state, like I said, not a huge part of what we do from on the county side. It's, it's a much larger role in terms of the school's budget, but this slide in here just for the following reason. The, the things that happen downtown in the General Assembly some good, some bad, depends on your perspective, but it has a real impact on our bottom line uh, here at the local government level. The decisions that are made there, they find their way here, whether it be revenues that are pulled away from us, revenues that aren't kept up to a formula, or expenditure mandates that come down. And we're just showing some things here on the county side of the equation. The schools has a laundry list themselves, and I think this is an issue where uh, there's a lot of common ground and something where both sides should be a little bit louder about the impacts uh, that the General Assembly, in regard, again, the intentions may be there, they may be good, but at the bottom line, just this handful of items, $13.6 million impact to our bottom line. That $13.6 million going into programs, services, infrastructure, roads, you name it, or you could think of it as a four cent reduction to our tax rate or some blend thereof. So we're gonna to continue to hear us be louder and louder about this issue and make sure that we understand and explain to our citizens the impact that, uh, that Richmond is having on us on a daily basis from a financial perspective. So let's look at some major components. I've talked primarily or referenced the general fund 
Um, that is the main operating fund for the county. And we typically, when you hear us talk about the budget, that's what we're referring to. The general fund is contains all the funding for public safety agencies, parks, libraries, social services, quality of life, all the administrative functions that uh, go along with that, as well as all local dollars that support education. So this, but this slide here starts to pull those pieces apart and just sort of frame from a, a, you know, a scale perspective the major components of the budget. So you see the schools and the lime on the far left-hand side, 810 million. That's the local piece plus the state piece, which is roughly a 50-50 uh, partnership here in Chesterfield County. The general fund, when you pull out the schools piece at 461, again, that does all the public safety, all the infrastructure, all the quality of life items, and then utilities. Uh, you know, very key piece of what we do here, having clean and re reliable drinking water and good sewer service uh, throughout the county is, is something that we, you know, too often take for granted but is made possible by, uh, by these investments of these dollars, 142 million of which is proposed for fiscal 22. And we'll touch on that very quickly at the end of the presentation. A couple of slides here I think are important um, just to kind of set the philosophical backdrop. When we're building a budget, it's not just looking at the economic information. There's a lot of other factors that we take into account. One of which is COVID itself and all the other you know crazy winter weather and uh, you know, 700 year floods and all the other biblical things I think that smacked us in uh, over the course of the last 12 months. We need to make sure all of those things are, you know, factored into our thinking as we prepare a budget. It's not just looking at the numbers, it's all those other factors combined. So we're highlighting COVID here, not to give you a COVID update or today what COVID is, but to say that particularly in the parks and library spaces, I think COVID has really underscored the importance of having those two departments, a library, not just as a place to go out and check out books, but to use it as a warming center, to use it as a small business resource center, a learning pod for folks that are uh, learning remotely, for folks to be able to go and register for a vaccine, uh, you name it, the libraries really showed their versatility over the last 12 months. And you see the investments to go along with that moving forward. Similarly, parks, particularly folks' ability to get out, be active in a, in a safe way, uh, we need to make sure we continue to invest in that because I think the community understands and appreciates, uh, again, parks in that way. And uh, you'll see the rest of this plan from an operating and a capital perspective that uh, you know, is reflective of that reality. These two charts and demographics, another factor we have to keep in the back of our mind and when we're putting spending plans together, the top chart looks at housing growth. And we're in, the message there, quite simply, is that we're in a good sustainable range. We like to be somewhere in that one to one and a quarter percent in terms of new single family units being put on the ground. That reflects a healthy level of growth and interest in the county, but also is something that we can maintain from an infrastructure perspective. And you can see back in 05 to 08, uh, particularly 05 to 07, some of those rates getting close to 3%, which is more than double what we really feel like is sustainable. But we've leveled out, and now over the last four or five years, averaging right on our long run average, uh, you know, around, again, one and a quarter, 1.3% is a really nice, healthy level. Depending on where you are in the county, that may feel like it's uh, more intense, but when you take all 400 some square miles, that's where we average out and it's a nice sustainable place. The bottom chart, really two trends going on here. They were looking at the percentage of single family units that produce a child that uh, attends Chesterfield County Schools. You see a dip there in 2020 that's a little stronger than the other ones. And that's simply a reflection of the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of folks, um, you know, pulled their children out for various reasons. That will undoubtedly bounce back up as things normalize a little bit. But still, the overall trend of that line is down a little bit. That's not reflective uh, necessarily of the fact that enrollment is dropping uh, in CCPS, except for 2020 with the uh, extenuating circumstances. It's more a reflection of the fact that our demographics overall, the overall profile, is changing quite a bit. And we are, our 65 and older segment is the fastest growing, it's now the largest portion of our overall population base. And so when we're thinking about ourselves from a resource perspective, we need to make sure we're investing and continue to invest in the school system. But as well, we've got to make sure that we're paying attention to that 65 and older crowd that is a larger and larger portion of the folks that live here. And that's a good thing. That's, uh, as Dr. Casey says, those are folks that are putting down roots 
they're staying here, their grandkids may be in a CCPS, and it, they're not moving out to, you know, wherever coastal destination when they retire. They're staying here in Chesterfield County, and we need to make sure we're investing appropriately. Not this is not to suggest it's at the detriment of the school division, but it has to be alongside of it. So how are the overall dollars invested in the general fund? This is looking at, again, at that 800 plus million dollars of the proposed general fund, how are those dollars spent? And this looks at it just in each individual dollar. I think it's a nice way we use this visualization each year. And this year, because of the investments in public safety pay and teacher pay, almost 80 cents out of every dollar is going to education, public safety, and that third slice there, capital or infrastructure, and that's just the physical plant that it takes to, uh, to run the organization. And those are also the three areas of the county where you know folks continually want to see more and more investment and that ratio actually moved from 76 to 78 with this proposal which doesn't sound necessarily like a lot but that's you know when you're talking about hundreds of million dollars that's really a seismic shift we're able to do that because of the fifth bar down there the general government slice at six cents out of every dollar that includes everything from our it to county legal to finance to admin to hr the general services, all of those support areas we can do for very, very low overhead. Again, at just six cents on a dollar allows us to spend 78 cents on things that folks really care about and impact their lives every single day. Another thing, we're going through a budget process, and again, I won't go into a whole lot of detail. There's a lot more detail in the resources that are available online, but it's important for us to communicate to the public that you know we take every dollar that's invested to us uh, as precious, and we don't consider them to be, uh, that they're necessarily gonna be there the next year. So the, the budget team does an excellent job. Uh, you know, Mr. Oakley, Mr. Durkin, their, their whole team, they go through and they looked at every single line item in the budget, and before we have a department that comes and asks for additional dollars, the question that we ask back for them is, how can you reallocate or how can you find efficiencies in your own area that allows you to take what you already have, what's already been entrusted to you, and spend it in a, in a different way and get your, you know, necessarily the goal that you're trying to achieve. This slide just shows you some examples of that, uh, where we had departments that have thought very creatively, general services, a lot of insourcing. And there's been sort of a, a boomerang on that where several years ago outsourcing was the trend. And I think we're finding as we've done some of that, that it actually makes more sense to bring things back in so we can uh, take those contract costs, invest in personnel, and actually save money, and in most cases, provide a better quality service to, uh, to the organization and to the community. Real estate assessments and uh, investing in a new system that is, frees up three uh, positions that are able to be redeployed elsewhere in the organization. That's always the goal. We spend a lot of money on technology. We always talk about it being efficient, but you know, here's an example where we're actually able to spend that money on technology, and it, it produces savings. Again, these are vacant positions that we held in uh, hoping that those efficiencies would materialize. They did, and then that goes and plugs three holes elsewhere in the organization. I won't go through any more of that, but just to, uh, to give a simple message to the community that we do take the resources that are entrusted to us very seriously, and we look at them. Uh, it's not just about the growth, but we do pay attention to the base very closely. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our budget manager, uh, Mr. David Oakley, who's going to walk you through some specific spending initiatives that are organized around these uh, six themes on your screen. Thanks, Mr. Harris. Starting off, we're going to go through, uh, through each one of these themes. Um, recognizing the workforce. This budget is really the year of the workforce, as you've heard board members and Dr. Casey tout. Employees have really stepped up, up over the last year, pivoting to other departments with greater needs due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, tele telehealth through, um, through the mental health operations, and of course, our frontline employees. To that point, the first bullet shows the fully funded public safety pay, pay plan on day one of FY 2022. It includes policies to ensure the plan remains in place in future years. Similarly, the plan includes funding to help implement the teacher pay study, which will impact over 4,700 teachers and other staff with raises of 8 to 11% for most compressed teachers. 
Teacher salary increases on average of 5.5%, totally more than 23.2 million. It's worth mentioning, of course, that these, pay, these two pay plans add up to 37 million in local funding to eliminate compression in the FY22 fiscal year. A mid-year 2% merit is planned for the general government staff, along with recent actions from the Board of Supervisors to conduct yet another pay study for all the remaining staff, uh, which would be implemented in future years. And lastly, this plan absorbs the ongoing costs related to teleworking, allowing Chesterfield staff to remain the dynamic workforce that provided such excellent service throughout the pandemic. Next initiative is investing in our children's future. It's worth talking again about the the teacher pay plan, uh, which will be fully funded in FY22. Local transfer to schools increases eight, 18 million over FY21. This represents the largest increase in school's history. An additional uh, four million in differentiated support, which was the second top priority for the schools, providing elevated services to the educational system where they're needed most. Preventative major maintenance comes in just under a million dollars in the plan. After the mid-year amendments that Mr. Harris referenced um, back in December included 58 million towards these major maintenance efforts. Next, we have our continuing commitment to public safety. Um, with the pay plan implemented, this budget allows larger focus on operations and systems, notably the addition of 20 staff for the New Midlothian Fire Station, which will add a ladder truck and a medic to the current system and then the implementation of the new deployment strategy, which has not been revamped since mid-1989. This will include nine positions and the funding of $1.8 million to cover additional logistical costs, and then adding four new sheriff positions to allow staffing flexibility and facility modernization as they've had to weather the pandemic in a unique way. Additionally, there's funding in the CIP for a courthouse security enhancement study. Uh, Then diversifying and bolstering our economic base. This plan fully funds the completion of our zoning ordinance rewrite, which has not been tackled since the mid-1970s. The businesses that Chesterfield County is trying to attract have changed quite a bit since then, and we are looking to update that to modernize it to the, to the current year, to what we see in 2021 and going forward. The plan is mindful of Chesterfield businesses. The business license exemption threshold is proposed to increase from 300 to 400, which is, would exempt an additional 400 businesses. This would mean that two thirds of the county businesses would only pay the $10 fee. This plan raises the personal property exemption from 1,000 to 1,500, which alleviates the personal property bill, of approximately 14,000 vehicles in the county. And then additionally, we, we will be expanding the tax relief to the elderly and disabled citizens um, by factoring in inflation to keep people in the program when eligible and also targeting relief where needed. And then of course, the state had the vote for um, tax relief for veterans, which is also included here. This is an extra million dollars bringing the overall program to seven million. Strengthening our investment in infrastructure, the large increases in sidewalks slash uh, trail uh, funding in the current CIP expanded to 19 million over the course of the five year, promote community connectivity and alleviate some of those areas that Mr. Harris was referring to in our park system. Plan, the plan reflects new capital funding source for the Central Virginia Transportation Authority. Uh, the additional investment of one, 116 million over the next five years boosting our transportation investment overall to over 200 million. This plan continues to adhere to the 2.5 replacement uh, policy for major maintenance facilities, and then also sets out uh, a potential referendum for November of 2022, which Mr. Harris will get into later in the presentation. The buildings and grounds, capital projects, workload staffing um, is being enhanced in order to take on the additional workload of the expanded um, referendum projects. And then got behind on my clicking. <laughs> and then taking a deeper dive into the enhanced transportation program, uh, you can see here that the $2 million 
in the current plan and 19 million over the, over the five-year plan. Same with the CVTA that we've already mentioned. General road improvements will be keeping up with the projects that were planned um, over the course of previous five-year plans and the revenue sharing of $10 million, $50 million over the five years will, it will take advantage of leveraging state funding. Thank you, Mr. Oakley. And uh, so just staying in the, uh, in the capital space for just one second, and this is uh, before we get into the questions at the end of the presentation, this is one that we've gotten consistently, not only in the Facebook events, but just as uh, through general inquiries from the public. So we thought we would add a slide to just kind of give some broader context about the referendum. So I'm going to spend a minute uh, on this because I think it will, you know, cut off some questions and uh, you provide some, hopefully provide some clarity. So referendum, what is it? It's, it sounds, uh, you know, awfully mysterious. It's just a ballot initiative that allows the county, authorizes the county to use what is called our general obligation bond authority. And that's a fancy way of saying it allows us to borrow uh, capital funds to put the kinds of facilities that are on your screen right now in place at the lowest cost possible. Uh, we can only do that with voter approval. The county, as well as the utility system, the, the Chesterfield County in, nationwide is one of less than five localities anywhere in the United States that has a perfect credit rating, not only for their general government and school division, but also for our utility division. And again, that's relevant because it allows us to borrow money at the lowest possible cost, which allows us to keep money in operations and or keep taxes low. So that's, uh, you know, we don't want to pay more interest costs than we, we do, just like anybody out there who's looking at a car loan or refinancing a mortgage, same thing for us. But in order for us to tap into that lowest tier of rate structure, we have to get voter approval. So that's why when we, we say a referendum, because referendum can mean many things, for us, that's what it means. We had originally, prior to COVID, talked about a referendum on the ballot for uh, local infrastructure as soon as this November of 2021, uh, but for a variety of reasons, don't feel like this year is necessarily the best timing for that. The economy is doing better. Uh, there's a lot of parts of our overall revenue portfolio that are performing well, but we recognize that you know, as an overall region, as an overall uh, county, there are still some soft spots. Uh, you saw that reflected, and, and it, it bears repeating in uh, Mr. Oakley's remarks, you know, the broadest package of tax relief that uh, this board has ever considered before them today, the budget is, is proposed, is offered up at 95 cents, but really a targeted approach that looks at not only veterans, seniors, low-income households, and small businesses. A lot of those groups uh, that the board has heard from, so a very targeted package. And we want to see, you know, and hope that the economy is even stronger, you know, a year and a half from now. So we are postponing that referendum until November of 2022. That by no means uh, suggests that we put pause on our building program here in Chesterfield County. The schools will still be uh, extremely busy wrapping up their 2013 referendum projects. Mr. Oakley said there's $60 million, give or take, of major maintenance projects that got authorized this past fall will continue. And then there's additional stimulus dollars coming down from DC that will give additional opportunities, particularly in the major maintenance space. And we say major maintenance, uh, again, that's just a fancy way of saying, you know, HVAC systems, major building replacement systems, whether it be roofs, HVAC, those kinds of items, reinvesting in existing buildings. It's not just about building a new school or knocking one down and rebuilding on the same site. A lot of it is investing in the, uh, in the structures that we've already got in place and work well for the community, but may just need a little bit of a facelift from, uh, from here or there. So in terms of the referendum, again, postponing it to November of 2022, it would be uh, tentatively sitting here today. And this will, you know, we will clean up this number and dial it in as we move forward. But looking at about a $450 million package, the slide on your screen shows the county side of that. Uh, the school piece not pictured, I think, is uh, still being worked out, but generally will focus on capacity and revitalization projects at the middle school level. The last time we did it on the school side, 2013, that was predominantly an elementary school package. So we're kind of chasing that 
uh, through the system, focus on middle school this time around with uh, some elementary school facilities. Maybe the next bond referendum starts to tackle some, some high school needs, but predominantly a middle school package uh, on that side of the house. And for us on the general government side, again, you see down in the bottom, the little table in the bottom right-hand corner, a very balanced uh, proposal. Looking again at those quality of life issues, parks and libraries, you got $70 million, almost half of the total there. Uh, fire stations recognize that we need to continue to, you know, pre predominantly reinvest in stations. A good example would be the Chester, uh, you know, would impact the, uh, the Bermuda District, a replacement Chester fire station. Uh, the police station is a new line for us. We're predominantly in a uh, lease arrangement with all of our stations. We want to convert those to facilities we own and have a chance to reevaluate those locations given our modern footprint. So that $32 million would cover four uh, police stations throughout the county, and we're working through those specific locations now. And then a complement funding to roads with uh, the CVTA, the new uh, regional authority that's been put in place, and all the other pieces that uh, Mr. Oakley touched on. We really have, this, this budget is more transportation funding, more investment in roads, sidewalks, trails, all of those things than any budget in the county's history. So it's a smaller piece here for roads. That by no means suggests how that falls in the overall hierarchy of things. It's just that we have other sources to take care of that. And again, as we touched on on the COVID slide, trying to move more of our resources into those quality of life uh, areas. So there'll be more to come on this. We will use the next 18 months to continue to refine this proposal. So then we go out in November of 22, it's a very, very uh, clear, concise, and tight package of projects, and the public understands what they're voting on, why they're voting on these projects. And uh, you know, there's still room, th there will be modifications to this on the county and school side. Uh, so a lot of work to be done ahead of the referendum. We will not take 18 months off in terms of our capital program. Uh, we are just gonna push this particular part of our capital program back a little bit. Mentioned earlier, you know, again, it doesn't get as much attention until you have a problem necessarily with uh, with your water sewer service, but we don't have those in Chesterfield County, and, you know, quite fortunately. Uh, Mr. Hayes and his team run a wonderful system. Again, they, uh, they have not only excellent service on a day-to-day -day basis, but financially, you won't find a more sound system anywhere in the United States. They are anticipating an average monthly increase of about $1.50, um, which shown there in the actual bar chart even factoring that in for our fiscal 22 rates, you see how we stack up against our regional peers, and it is extremely competitive. The lowest in the region, even with those increases, we don't know what the other systems will propose. Uh, we took a year off in terms of increases to water and sewer service last year, given COVID, and that was an easy way to go and uh, try to give people a little bit of breathing room in their household budgets. So coming back this year, proposing a very small increase uh, to keep the system up and running as, uh, as everyone has come to expect. So moving forward, just to uh, recap a couple points here. Uh, CARES funding, stimulus funding, whatever you want to call it. There's a lot of acronyms. Uh, you can't pick a newspaper up without seeing some bill that's coming through somewhere. Those are not incorporated here. Uh, this budget is not dependent on one-time federal money to make any of the things that we've talked about happen. The pay plans, the investment in the workforce is done on a local basis. Uh, not from these federal dollars, but we need to take those seriously. There are great opportunities as we did with schools major maintenance and a lot of the other things, uh, small business grant programs. We helped out daycares, uh, food banks, utility bill relief, all of those things that have been done. We'll continue to look for those opportunities. That will come back probably late April or May for those uh, plans to be approved by not only the school board, but uh, ultimately by the board of supervisors. There will be amendments to everything you're seeing here. Probably, you know, from what we've seen thus far, the feedback's been very positive. There will be just some, probably some technical items, maybe in addition here or there. Uh, the state revenue estimates come in late in the process, so those aren't often factored in uh, when we're doing our proposed budget. So there might be some, a little bit of a change there, again, ahead of April the 7th when the board votes on this. Tonight wraps up our virtual community meetings. Public hearing is in here tomorrow night. You can watch it on YouTube or either of uh, the cable channels. If you can't come but you want to say something, again, that online form is out there at the Blueprint Chesterfield website. And as I mentioned already, blueprint at chesterfield.gov, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. That's a great way to drop us a line 
ask a question, leave a comment. Uh, if there's just some way that we can orient the materials better on the website so that it makes it easier for folks to navigate, please, you know, we're open to any of that kind of feedback. Um, with that being said, I will uh, turn it back over to Mr. Ingle. you have any, any remarks? And we think we got a couple questions that have come in. Let's go to the questions. Let's go to the questions. All right. So the first question that came up uh, looks at, again, Parks and Rec in terms of the CIP, the capital funds uh, for the Parks and Rec. Uh, the specific question is it looks like there's less than there was last year. I think that's really a result of the referendum being pushed out uh, another year. So yeah, absolutely, our major park development funds uh, are contingent, at least you know, sitting here today, on that bond referendum. Uh, but it's as we just touched on in that slide, it's a very comprehensive package. We don't have those projects final finalized, but I think you will see at the end of the day that the leading candidates would be uh, the new Fallen Creek Park project, which is a combination of local funds as well as uh, some funds from Dominion to be able to go in there and provide that water access and the other amenities that go along with that. Cogbill Park also uh, it's in the Dale District, which is something that's been on the slate for quite some time, an expansion of Horner Park, uh, an expansion of River City Sportsplex, and as well as there's funding in this in that referendum for a potential second water access site as well. So it's uh, there are a number of park projects, much more than, we haven't had a, a robust parks referendum like that probably since 2004. Uh, but you know, even worst case scenario, the referendum uh, gets pushed out again, doesn't pass, whatever. There are other ways for us to continue to make investments in parks, but uh, we feel very good with that package. Those are projects we've been talking about. You know, Cogbo Park, we've been talking about that with the Dale District and uh, Mr. Holland's residence for probably, you know, three or four years, if not more. So with a lot of feedback, a lot of buy-in to that package and feel very good about where that, uh, where that stands. Uh, next question from Angela, what effect does the new federal funding have on the 22 budget? And, and Angela, it's a great question. I think we touched on it a little bit throughout the presentation, but it, what we've shown you tonight is not impacted. So we're not, we're not betting on additional rounds of federal funding coming down to us. We use that as supplemental funding on the county and the school side. Uh, to, again, really looking at one-time opportunities. Uh, again, major maintenance, anything we can do in the infrastructure side of the house is very useful with, uh, with federal funding. You don't necessarily want to set up new programs and services and set that expectation and then have to figure out where that funding is going to come from when the federal dollars get pulled away, which they inevitably always do. So we don't have the rule book necessarily on this new round of federal funding that's going to come down. Schools is also expecting to uh, to get additional federal funds. The rule books are usually very tightly constructed, and we will once we get that in hand, like I said, we will bring that back in April or May, uh, work that through the school board, through the board of supervisors, have public feedback. We'll probably have another series of, uh, of Facebook Lives, at least one or two, to kind of share. Here's the final estimates we got. Here's what we're going to do with it. And we got around uh, late, late summer last year. We also want to make sure that we are providing answers to you all to the uh, to the board in terms of what we did with those monies uh, last year so a lot to come on the federal topic but not anything that's contingent on uh, the teacher pay plan uh, the public safety pay plan all of the other investments in quality of life here in Chesapeake County are not dependent on those dollars coming through so I think that's a great question Looks like th Mr. Engel, that's, uh, that sort of wraps up our, our Facebook questions. I think we try to incorporate as many of those ahead of time into the presentation as we can. So I don't know if you have any other comments. Well, I'd just like to thank you, Matt and David, for your FY22 budget presentation this evening. Thank you again to Ann for being here. And most importantly, thank you to the citizens that have participated tonight or that will watch this video in the coming days. I hope we've answered your questions here tonight. But it's not your last opportunity, as we will have a public hearing with the full Board of Supervisors tomorrow night at 6 p.m. If you have any other questions, you can enter them into the portal online or email me at engelj at chestfield.gov. And as Mr. Harris uh, mentioned earlier, you can also email us at blueprint at chesterfield, 
at chestfield.gov um, prior to the budget adoption on April 7th. Enjoy the rest of your night, and God bless.